Hey, if any of you uh, question the merit and the worthwhileness of the old bowl pilots, what a mixture you're getting this morning. You've had two presentations already from people who really know what they're talking about, information that you really need to know. We are balancing that this morning with an address from Dan Gilbertson. <laughs> <laughs> now, Seriously, it's been my privilege to, uh, to work with Dan for over two years as he's served as chairman of the board of the Air Museum. And you talk about a classic situation of herding cats, it's being chairman of the board of the Air Museum. But uh, he's a man who has deep roots in the Palm Springs area, and now in the, the thaw permits, he has deep roots in Alaska. But uh, without further ado, it's my privilege to introduce Mr. Dan Gilbertson. everybody for putting this uh, breakfast together this morning. A lot of persistence. I've been asked for several years to do this and I don't normally get up in front of people and talk about aviation but I ever since I was a little kid I've had to defend my heritage in Alaska and flying and you know it, I'm a 3,000 hour plus pilot that flies bush airplanes. Now I'm not a bush pilot but I fly ski planes, full planes, and wheel planes, and probably more comfortable on a float plane than I am anything. But um, I have beavers, otters, uh, howards, cubs, and I fly them all. And uh, I have friends that are really bush pilots that do stuff that I couldn't dream of doing with an airplane. And I've always got the fear of bending something up or tearing something up, so I'm probably not the guy out there on the raggedy edge, at least not on purpose. So, But uh, I, I got to ask, there's a bunch of the museum guys here today, can I have a raise of hands? Yeah, great, good bunch of guys, and you know, we, uh, we think a lot of that Air Museum. So, um, you know, it's, I, I actually used to speak in front of a pilot's group, a private, a private group of pilots that were commercial bush pilots, and, one of the things I asked at a meeting one night was at what age was the pilot inspired? And we went around the table, there was about 50 pilots there, and you could not believe the stories. But I think that inspiration, you know, for a pilot starts at a really young age. Anybody here inspired before they were five? Show of hands. Six, seven. About 10 years old. Everybody's got a story of inspiration. And that's the, one of the things that I like to talk about because I want to inspire the next generation. I got three kids and none of them flew, so I really failed on that <laughs> level. But there's hope with the grandkids. <laughs> so um, it's, uh, it's my pleasure to give this information. I'm going to put up about 20 pictures. Uh, some of it's my family history. Uh, very little of it's mine, but uh, both I am very familiar with most of these airplanes, and a lot of these pictures actually came off the internet. And as time goes on, there are more and more photos added to the internet. And my wife, she she says, "Why do you spend a lot of time on the internet with the airplanes? It's just it's 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 unbelievable. There's millions of pictures of airplanes, and I enjoy that kind of stuff. So." Um, We'll start, uh, let me see if I can get this thing to work. This picture was taken when I was eight years old. And my, uh, my dad was a L-382 pilot. For you military pilots, it's a civilian version of a C-130. And by congressional mandate, when they announced the, the oil discovery on the North Slope, they had to build this pipeline and support it. And so this company in Fairbanks that my dad flew for was um, allowed to purchase two L-382 civilian Hercules off the assembly line. And my dad was one of the guys that went down there and learned how to fly the airplane and trained all the other pilots. So I don't even think my dad knew what school I went to. And he showed up 
in May of 1969 and picked me up at school. I'm like, oh, what's up with this? Well, he said, hey, we're going, we're going to Prudhoe. So we got in this Herc, and this Herc was just a couple of months old and flew to Prudhoe. Now, there was a co-pilot, a flight engineer, and a loadmaster. I actually got out, he actually got out of the seat for this uh, photo opportunity. But, uh, you know, try to go back to uh, uh, show and tell uh, in the third grade and tell uh, the kids, yeah, I was flying a Herc yesterday. You know, they're like, you know, the, the, you know, the kids couldn't even identify with it. So as part of my deal of uh, defending my Alaskan aviation uh, heritage, and I, and I was born and raised in Fairbanks, and uh, my parents, bought a couple of B-25 bombers in 1967 and my dad figured out how to fly them and he was an airline captain he worked for this airline for 17 years and uh, they employed him firebombing on a contract in Alaska and uh, anyway the, the one B-25 is actually the B-25 that's in the uh, Air Museum in Palm Springs the other one's over in Chino so imagine telling people that, you know, that's your family's B-25, and you know, you get a lot, a lot of bullshit. I mean, how do you know that? Well, it, through the internet, as you can figure it out, but uh, very much inspired by the B-25, and obviously you can see this is not a B-25. This is one of my favorite airplanes. And this airplane here is a Howard DGA-15, which was Benny Howard's design. And uh, they built them for the military. Most of them were built in 1943. It shares some common pieces with a Beaver. Uh, same engine, same propeller, and in this case, the same floats. I put a set of Beaver floats on it. There would never been a set of Beaver floats installed on a Howard. So a couple years ago, five years ago, I was sitting in my backyard in Fairbanks, and I live off the end of the float pond, and I see this really fast beaver coming. And I'm looking at him, and I go, God, he's hauling ass. I mean, I, that, that beaver don't go that fast. You know, I fly beavers. <laughs> anyway, I raced over to the float pond, and there's a 22-year-old kid flying a Howard on floats. So I talked to him for about five minutes. I asked him if I could go fly it, and, you know, he wouldn't give me the time of day. And after watching him for about 20 minutes, he did, I'm surprised he made it to Wisconsin, and he did not fly that airplane at all. So anyway, I was inspired by the Howard. This particular, uh, this picture was taken in Ketchikan, so you can see how thin the wings are. And it really goes, it goes about 140 miles an hour on floats, which is pretty respectable for a float plane. This gentleman here, this was his airplane. And uh, if you don't, if, if people from the Pacific Northwest would, would maybe know who he was, he is, his name was Clayton Scott, he flew a thousand B-17s off the assembly line. He was a Boeing test pilot. He flew the first uh, mail on the West Coast. And he was Bill Boeing's personal pilot. And he was the first person to fly a 727. He did the test program in it. Anyway, he owned this particular Howard. So when it popped up for sale in Anchorage a few years ago, I Five years ago, I literally clubbed the poor guy that owned it. I mean, he wanted $125,000. I'm going, no, you ain't going to get $125,000. How much you really want? Well, I found out, because Alaska is such a small place, he was buying a new caravan. And he needed some money. And he wasn't flying the airplane. I said, will you take fifty grand for the airplane? <laughs> no, I won't sell the airplane for fifty grand. He called me back a couple weeks later and says, when can I get the money? So that's how it all started. Scotty, I actually knew him. He flew till he was 100 years old. And he was the first person, according to Wikipedia, that landed at Boeing Field. He was a great guy. I met him a few times. Little did I know that I'd be flying his airplane. This is my airplane, still painted by him. The log books are full of his signatures and stuff. And it's, it's really something to fly a museum piece. And I, I'm kind of careful when it, I don't want to tear it up. But uh, he was quite a guy, Scotty was. This is another Howard that I'm working on over in Chino. And I've got four guys helping me. And their names all end in O. I got Eduardo, I've got Nando, Mario, and uh, Waldo. 
It's been a long, painstakingly processed job. I mean, it's, it's wearing me out. I, I could rebuild four de Havilland beavers in the time I've spent on this Howard, but as you can see, it, it's all painted now. When we're this was two assemblies ago, we're assembling it for the last time, and it's all painted. It's beautiful. I, I didn't start out to build an Oshkosh award-winning Howard, but uh, that's what we got. And there's the, the Howard that I put on floats. Uh, that's sitting in Fairbanks. Some guy was out there one night. This is about 10 o'clock at night. He asked me if he could take a picture of the Howard. I said, sure. So we spun it around and my pickup happened to be parked behind it. So we got a picture of my truck and the Howard. And this is on the internet. I, I, I found this on the internet. So um, there it is on floats. That's when I flew it up a couple of years ago. I actually went from Juneau to Fairbanks in it in four hours and 15 minutes, and it's 550 nautical miles. And uh, it's, a, it's a lot of fun to fly. It was interesting, I had a, an outfit up in Vancouver put it on floats, and these guys specialize in beavers. So, you know, the Canadians are just hammering me on this airplane. I had one of their guys go out and test fly it, and they sent me a video of it, because I was, I was down here and I, I couldn't get up there. And, Jesus, they wouldn't get off the water. And I, I said, wow, and they're laughing, they're teasing me. They said, yeah, so I went from one bridge to the next on the Fraser River to get it off. And I'm going, oh no, this ain't gonna work. So anyway, I went up a couple months later and test flew it. Well, I, I understood by then that you used full flaps for takeoff in this thing on the lobes. It went on step in six seconds and it was out of the water in 10 seconds and accelerating like a sports car, like nothing, like no beaver that ever flies. It's really quite an airplane, so I, uh, I really enjoy it. It's a lot of fun. This airplane, uh, I'll show you some more pictures of it. It's kind of a sad story, but this is up on Mount McKinley. I, I've been supplying airplanes to the, uh, the tour operators in Alaska for, well, about 35 years. And it's something my parents, my dad and I started with the beavers. Uh, my mom and dad had brought the first beaver to Alaska in 1958. There's a picture of it here somewhere. There's what my customer did to my uh, beaver. So he called me up and he says, Dan, he goes, I got some bad news. And I said, well, you're not dead. What'd you do to my airplane? This guy lands on Mount McKinley every day, by the way. That was a picture before. He goes, well, I landed in the middle of this lake, and the airplane fell through the lake. So within an hour, I had pictures from the air from some of my other friends. This is up by Talkeetna. And I kind of had an idea of what he did. I mean, you don't land out in the middle of the lake in the fall. You land, you know, you get you turn around near the shore. You've got sort of the thick ice is. Well, it was a mess. I mean, the airplane froze in for six weeks. And here's my son and I last summer. On another bed, this guy that was storing the wreckage for me said that it wouldn't fit in the trailer. And I said, well, with that attitude, you'll probably never own a beaver. I said, it will fit in that trailer. We're going to put it in. It took six of us to get it in there, and it wasn't easy. But the whole beaver's in a snow machine trailer. This is another one of the planes that's up on Mount McKinley. Um, I got chastised about this one really, really a lot because uh, the airplane was all white and with the DG N number on it, I was, <laughs> unbeknownst to me, they were calling it Delta Ghost. The guys up on Mount McKinley hated this thing. There's about 25 airplanes that fly up there every day on skis and this airplane's white landing on Mount McKinley. So I, it, was, it was kind of funny, but we ended up putting some stripes on it and it wasn't too bad. But it that is a de Havilland Otter, and uh, I, it was converted over from a piston engine to a PT-6 turbine, and it really turns it into an airliner, it, you know, for the bush, and it'll take off, and you can put 10 people in there and take off in 300 feet. And where you land is kind of interesting. It's uphill, about 10, 10, 10 degrees, and it's bumpy like this, so when you land on it, you got to keep the tail level. It's, I, I wish that I could show the video of these things land, and there's probably 20 otter landings a day on Mount Denali. And uh, 
it's uh, they park the plane faces downhill you can't see the skis but it's a, it's a beautiful trip up there um, I had a friend come up and visit a few years ago and he's not a pilot and so I give him the Alaska tour and I said hey you want to go up you know my guy's flying out of Healy you want to go up on Mount McKinley oh sure so we went up on Mount McKinley well it's my airplane so I didn't fly it I got in the right seat and I fell asleep on the way to Mount McKinley. It's about an hour and 20 minutes from uh, Healy. And I woke up because everybody was laughing in the airplane because I was sleeping in the front. We're going through some of the most beautiful mountains and it was in the fall, it was fresh snow. But you know, you see that all the time. You don't, you, you kind of take it for granted. Now this is the, the, the plane that my parents bought in 50 eight or 59 and uh, leased it to the company that my folks my dad flew for and this was the first civilian beaver in alaska the military had them but this was a, a civilian one and the funny thing about this picture is is that these these four gals from anatomic pass this is up in the arctic in the spring the one of them is wearing boppy socks and little black shoes the other one's wearing mucklucks so you can kind of see that you know things were starting to change. You know, maybe she was watching Bobby Darren movies, and and uh, but it's, it's it's cute. You can, yeah, it's funny. I mean, it's, you don't think anything of it. I actually blew this picture up, and I have it in the house, and it's kind of a cute shot. And the, the beaver looks ratty. You know, it's only a couple years old, but they were getting used. You know, the airplane looks pretty rough. This is uh, the the B twenty five that's in the, the air museum. And this was the folks' airplane. And, you know, I, I thought as a kid the airplane should have been flowing down to Palm Springs when my dad and mom were done with it. My dad thought I was nuts. You know, I'm 11 years old. I said, Dad, can you bring the B-25 down? He goes, you know what it cost to bring that down? And I'm going, well, it'd be really cool because then all my friends at school would believe me that we own B-25s. Well, the airplane wound up in the Palm Springs Air Museum. And it's, uh, it's really neat, it's, it drew me in, to, you know, with all the fine people there, and I get to put my hand on, it's like going to church. This was a, a very unique airplane that my parents bought in 1968. And it was a Bill Lear converted Lodestar. And it had uh, JADO on it, Jet Assisted Takeoff for Emergencies. And it was the most beautiful airplane. We used to fly back and forth to Alaska. I've actually got some pretty good pictures of me standing with my dad in front of the airplane here in Palm Springs in the, in the late 60s. But it, uh, Bill Lear had done some things to it to make it uh, faster and more streamlined. And it was uh, had a bathroom in it, had a galley in it, 14 seats, and literally had range to fly from Fairbanks to Palm Springs nonstop. <laughs> It was, this was one of the executive transports of the day until the Gulfstream 1 came out. The Howard 500s and these things, they were built for the oil companies. But it's a very unique airplane. About 225 knots. Yeah. And this is the B-25 that's in the Air Museum. As you can see, it's got a hard nose on it. It was the only B-25 in Alaska that had the the, the gun notes on it you know, when they were firebombing. We referred to it as Antique 7, and it looks like an antique. It looks pretty rough there, but that was a Sea Grant 7, one of the mechanics painted on the tail. The B 25s all had A numbers, so they called them antiques. And I grew up around the B 25. There was 10 of them operating out of Fairbanks. And it was really something. I, I can identify with the Dulo Raid and the kind of flying that those guys would take off at. Uh, Fort Wayne, right? We lived about a half a mile off the end of the runway, and they'd come right over the house at the treetop level, hauling the the borey. Dan, would you relate what happened with your dad when his first contract, the difference in pay, and being a captain and queen? Yeah, uh, my my dad was uh, my dad and mom were entrepreneurs. I think my truth be known, my dad was a tool in my mother's toolbox <laughs> because she was the entrepreneur my dad was the pilot and uh, my father had worked for Weems for like 17 years and he was a senior captain making 1200 bucks a month 
and in the summer of 1969 with the B-25 my parents put $800,000 in the bank in six weeks with two B-25s and that's when we moved to Palm Springs and equivalent today is probably eight or ten million dollars I mean we were like the Beverly Hillbillies and my parents paid cash for everything airplanes cars houses we moved on to Mesquite and uh, it was a quite quite a deal, you know. I had a, a life in Alaska and a life in Palm Springs. I actually learned to fly here in Palm Springs. And this airplane here was a plane that my 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 parents bought in about mid seventies, and it was N one five one, which is probably a really you know unique number for an airplane. I think everybody wants that number, and uh, it was a uh, it was built as a freighter. And it was used on, my parents used it on the Trans-Alaska Pipeline for hauling fuel and, and uh, materials. The DC-6 would haul uh, about 30, 35,000 pounds, this one would. And it was, uh, my parents were second owners of, a, of a, several DC-6s. Some, some they bought from United, some Pan Am. Uh, and uh, this was, a, I used to fly this when I was uh, 17 years old. I was co-pilot in this airplane. I had a private pilot's license. Uh, my dad was, my mom were one of the 121 air carriers in Alaska, and my dad just said, hey, I own the airline, the kid's a co-pilot. And that's what it was. I didn't feel too comfortable with it, but they wouldn't let me land it or take it off, and I got to, I got, I got a couple hundred hours in my logbook in one by one. There's another picture of it. It's a little cleaner picture. They called it Silver Streak. Uh, it was fast, and uh, you can see the fuel tanks through the door. It had 5,500 gallons of tanks inside for hauling fuel. We could pull the tanks out an hour and convert it back to a freighter. This was one of the parents' F-27s. Uh, this got a Delta Gulf in number on it. My parents had a bunch of these. They had them on contract in Alaska, and they were doing some schedules with them. Uh, they were nice airplanes. They, uh, they put front-end cargo doors in these airplanes. The, the 227s had cargo door options, but the F-27s didn't have cargo doors in them. My, my, they, my parents put cargo doors in them to fit the, uh, the contract they had for them. It was a really unique airplane. This airplane wound up with FedEx because of the cargo door. Uh, this is uh, some of the parents' uh, DC-3s. Uh, this particular one was owned by Morrison Knudsen, and I think they bought it new. And uh, my dad knew somebody at MK and uh, was able to buy it from them when they decided to get rid of it in, in the late 60s. It was a really nice dove. This picture was taken probably in 74. <coughs> and we had a, a fleet of beautiful DC-3s. And they were all 121 airplanes. They were all air carrier airplanes. And uh, this was one of my favorite, 6 4 Kilo. This has uh, got quite a story to it. This airplane, my, my dad and uh, mom bought it in Costa Rica in 1963 from uh, KLM. And uh, my folks went down, or my dad went down. My mom was raising the kids. <laughs> dad was down in Costa Rica for three months. I can only imagine that getting this thing ready to go and part of the deal with uh, KLM was new engines and this was a cargo plane that they had a contract for it delivering uh, uh, food and uh, passengers to the Navy uh, uh, deal that was up on the North Pole. They were on the ice cap up there and the Connie had the, the range. Well, as airplanes go, it found another life. That's a, a nice picture of it in the mountains somewhere in Alaska. Not sure where, but it was a beautiful picture. Uh, it's getting a little odd. I'll go back to that one. This picture here, I want to show you this. I want to talk about this. This is the same constellation that my parents owned. And it wound up as a tour airplane for the Rolling Stones. And that's how it was painted. With, and this was after my parents owned it. It's actually in a museum over in England in TWA colors. But with the advent of the internet and all these pictures getting posted, a friend of mine, and some of you may know Stan Stokes, he painted this for me. 
and it's it's that big, the picture is. And we decided, that even though my parents didn't own it in the Rolling Stones years, that we put that paint job on it. I didn't care for the lean paint job. My dad would, even though he'd been dead for 10 years, it probably kicked me under the table and put that paint job on a portrait. So, um, there's a, this is kind of an interesting story. This airplane here, the C-82 packet, was a, uh, it belonged to TWA, and they used it to chase all of their broken down Connies and DC-7s over the eastern Atlantic, because they had broken down airplanes when they were fairly new, engine problems on those airplanes, and they had a complete machine shop in the back of it with spare engines to follow their fleet around. Well, it wound up in Alaska in the early 60s, kind of derelict and obsolete. And then the B-25 sitting behind it was, is the one that's in the Palm Springs Air Museum. Now, this was before my parents owned it. And I would never have thought my dad would have bought this airplane, but it wound up down in Miami, Florida in the 70s. And one of my dad's old buddies that used to sell him DC-6s asked him, about buying it. My dad said, what the hell am I going to do with that thing? And he goes, I don't know, but you can have it for 20 grand. My dad told the guy, his name was Jim Boyd, this was about 73, he goes, I'll tell you what, 10,000 bucks FOB paint field. Jim said, sold. Two days later, it showed up with a couple of Cubans flying it. <laughs> and it sat there for years. I mean, it sat at paint field for for probably six or seven years, and then a buddy of mine, we were going to go into the air cargo business, I was about 21, and I talked him into buying it, and it turned out to be a disaster. You know, the thing caught fire, and it was just a bunch of junk anyway, but neat old airplane. And that's it, that's my girlfriend from 16. So, has, has anybody got any questions? I mean, I, 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 I don't want to think of myself as an authority on Alaskan aviation, but I can, I can talk about the bush flying and the, some of the different things that have, have gone on over there for probably days. Yeah, well, the, the Hercules I was riding in was interiors. That was, uh, my dad worked for them for five years. That's who I started with in 65. In Fairbanks? Yes. Did you know my dad? Yes. yes. Oh, oh, yeah. And uh, then I went with PAA, which is Northern Airlines. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I just stayed around for a while. Yeah, he worked for the Red Dodge. Okay. Yeah, what a character he was. I could give a whole program on Red Dodge. He wound up being number one on the seniority list. <laughs> Western because of the PNA affiliation and what a character that guy was an entrepreneur. He was kind of like my dad. They drank martinis, chased girls, and flew airplanes really good. <laughs> so, go ahead. Did you ever fly with Senator Ted Stevens? You know, he was my my grandfather's attorney when he came to Alaska. I knew Ted. Uh, my dad and Ted didn't get along very well because my dad used to have to give Ted lots of money for his campaign and my dad didn't agree with his politics, but I guess I knew Ted. I didn't fly with him. Uh, my dad maybe flew him on some campaign trips and stuff, I'm sure, because of the political affiliations. But he was quite a guy. I was, I was with him three nights before he crashed up in Alaska. And uh, I asked him, why, when you and your wife crashed, why was she killed and you weren't? He said she was in the front seat. Yeah. And he said, you know, I'm going to die in an airplane. Yeah, he did. And he wasn't wearing a seatbelt. He died in an otter. And uh, he died in an otter uh, crash. Um, and it goes back to the old thing, the old bush pilot thing. You know, I've got friends that fly 747s. And they've got a float rating. And I said, well, they go, let's go fly. And I go, well, sure. And I'll go see what they're made of. And it, just because you can fly a 747 between Tokyo and New York has nothing to do with flying into Avalon Beaver on floats. <laughs> but yeah, that was a prime example. The guy flying the airplane, I, I read a lot about it, you know, because being an otter owner, I have to know why these things crash, and it was it was pilot air. The guy, the guy actually, they think he had a stroke and died in the airplane before it hit the 
but there was the guy, the people in the back seat that didn't have their seat belts on were the ones that were killed. Yeah, and it was a survivable wreck. Of, actually, one of my customers owns the wreckage, and I hope he doesn't fix it. I mean, I, that would be a, a bad thing. But yeah, Ted, Ted, you know, Ted had some real close calls, as all these politicians did in Alaska. So, any other questions? Do you have any? Uh, on a meteorologist down pilot. Okay. Do you have these weather stories that uh, go with your, your airplane? Sure. You know, there's a, we have a real benefit in Alaska for flying. We have all these weather camps. There's about 300 of them. So flying around Alaska, I actually flew a beaver from Anchorage to Fairbanks about uh, a month ago. And I waited, I was there in December to pick the beaver up and it started snowing. It was a VFR flight. I, I actually bought the last government-owned beaver. It's owned by the government its whole life. I bought it from the CAP last fall. But those cameras come in really handy. They're in all the passes in Alaska, and, and you can get them. You can put them on your phone. You can look at them. You can look at them in flight if you've got cell service. You know, or it's a it's a very handy tool. And I think it's actually saved a lot of people. I'll say one thing. They determined here about uh, six or seven years ago there was over 20 fatalities in single engine airplanes with guys running through these passes in the weather. Well, it turns out that a lot of Alaska was mapped on horseback with sextants and stuff and there were estimates. Some of the passes are three or 400 foot off and you put this information in your GPS and it's deadly. There's been, uh, they say they're going to fix it, but i tell you what, if you're flying in bad weather and a GPS in Alaska through those passes and stuff, you're flying by the seat of your pants. And uh, they, they say that Afghanistan and Iraq are better mapped than the surface of Alaska. It's hard to believe. It's really, you know, and you can probably speak to that. I, you know, I, it's funny, <laughs> he mentioned, Michael mentioned, Flying in on a thermal, well, that's the only time that I've ever landed a Cub on the same runway that a Cessna Citation was touching down on going the other direction. <laughs> and the guy was coming in from the border, calling the, you know, the FBO, they're wondering where his rented car was. There's three of us in the pattern landing to the south on uh, 17 calling in, when I'm in the pattern, I'm a, I just want everybody to know what I'm doing. I'm usually calling base, I'm calling midfield, I'm calling all my positions, short final. And this guy came in and landed against traffic, all of us, and I don't think he was aware we were even there. I, I was a little shook up. I gotta tell you, I, went, I landed, I went over to the gas pump, and I'm talking to Derek, this kid that works at the gas pump, and he heard the whole conversation, and I said, and he's a pilot, and I said, did I leave anything out? And he goes, no, he said, that was bad. And he goes, you know what, this happens all the time here. I'm going, really? Well, last fall, I was flying my beaver up from Ocotillo Wells. I went down to my buddy's junkyard down there in the beaver. And I was coming back. And you know, when you're in a De Havilland, okay, people maybe think you're in a jet. I know I've had this problem with the, uh, you, know, uh, the you know, the ATC and they think you're going faster than you are. Well, I 10 miles out landing to the north at uh, Thermal and called my position five times. And I touched down on the runway and this guy in the Cessna asked me to you know, get off the runway as soon as I could. And I just, you know, the, the taxiways are kind of at an angle. I wasn't even off the runway and this twin Cessna goes by me on the runway. You know, and I was a little close, but I, I don't even want to go down there and buy gas anymore. They need to get some stuff straightened out down there. I don't need to, they need a tower down there. Really bad. And I, you know, I'm not a scaredy cat, but I'm getting a little, a little nervous about flying in and out of thermal. I'm always talking to somebody. So, but anyway, that's what I got. And I, I hope you folks enjoyed it. I, uh, I could do it again. Hopefully I